Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the webinar focusing on our fourth annual Solar in the Southeast report. My name is Kate Tracy, and today we are joined by Brian Jacob, who is the author of this report and our solar program director, as well as Dr. Stephen Smith, who's the executive director of the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. And joining us on the Q&A portion will be Maggie Schober, who is the director of utility reform. Um, just a few quick notes about this webinar. We will be taking questions at the end of it, so you can submit those using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. If you're with a publication, please to note which publication you are with when you are submitting your question, and we will get the, to those at the end. This webinar is being recorded, and we will send the recording to registrants following the webinar. So if you need to hop off for any reason, you can catch up later today, and we'll also send out another link to the report webinar. So let's get us started. I will pass it over to Stephen Smith to kick us off. Great. Thank you, Kate, and thank you everybody for joining. Again, my name is Stephen Smith. I'm the exec executive director of the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. SACE is a, a regional uh, energy policy and environmental org advocacy organization that does work throughout the Southeast United States. And so it's, uh, it's very exciting to be presenting presenting uh, our fourth annual Solar in the Southeast report. Uh, this is uh, an important way to sort of keep track on how this very important technology is growing and evolving uh, in our region. Um, clearly this past year has been a very unusual and unprecedented and in many ways tragic year for a lot and with a lot of challenges. Uh, with the pandemic. But the good news, and Brian will get into the details, is generally this technology has continued to move very rapidly forward. And uh, he'll get into the details, but we're seeing that uh, the large solar uh, development has continued to move forward apace. We've seen a little bit of drop off in the, in the distributed solar, but um, that is not unexpected given what we've been through. So this technology continues to grow and expand and is a very, very critical part of how we are bringing clean energy uh, across the region, how we are decarbonizing the grid itself. And then as we, for those of you who participated in our uh, reports uh, last week where we were looking at the clean electricity standard and how the decarbonization decarbonization of the electric power grid also enables decarbonization and transportation through electric vehicles and electrification and transportation, and then also decreasing uh, the, the carbon uh, components associated with buildings and others. So this is very, very important. And in the sunny Southeast, solar is the technology that is um, leading and uh, will continue to lead and continue to grow. And in, in our uh, clean electricity standards, we'll talk more about that during the webinar, but solar is a, is a huge workhorse in um, meeting the goals as we move forward. So we're continuing to keep the eye, our eyes on what's going on in Washington with the infrastructure bill, but this is all very relevant because of the solar technology being such an important component. Lastly, um, we are going to uh, begin to look forward on some things. Brian will get into this a little bit more. But we are um, becoming concerned, I would say maybe a little too strong, but we really do believe that there's a lot of transactions that are happening between parties over state lines where um, renewable energy credits or the attributes of solar uh, associated with solar are moving between parties. We do not believe there's enough transparency in that. We are going to, over the next year, be looking at that more. Brian will talk to a little bit more about that, but. Uh, as we continue to grow and the utilities come up with all these creative ways of um, offering solar to customers, we also need to make sure that there's good accountability and not double counting. And so we're going to be looking at that. You'll, we'll get into that a little bit too. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to the primary author of the report, Brian Jacobs, and uh, look forward to uh, what he has to say and Q&A. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Kate. Um, Thank you to all of you who are here with us today. Um, this is our fourth annual Solar in the Southeast report. 
it's possible some of you have been with us for the launch of, of each of them. Um, and if so, you're gonna find this one very familiar um, because the, the format is virtually identical. The, the only difference is uh, we used to embed Appendix B, which lists uh, almost 500 utilities in the Southeast. Uh, and so there was an extra 16 pages appended to the end of, of each report. We've now got a link at the end of the report that you click on, it'll download that information to you for those of you that are interested. Um, but that allowed us to slim down the body of the report to just 23 pages. Um, and that includes the, the seven pages, one per state that represents the state profile. So that's all in there still. Um, and even though I suspect a lot of you have been with us before, there may be some newcomers. Uh, so if everyone would indulge me, I'd like to <clears throat> go over some terminology that, that I often take for granted. Uh, just to make sure that we're kind of level set and um, can can talk uh, the same lingo as we move forward. Um, I'll talk a lot about megawatts and a little bit about megawatt hours. Uh, megawatts is a unit of measurement for the, the instantaneous capacity of resources. And megawatt hours is a unit of measurement for the energy that's produced by those resources over a period of time. Uh, and, and I may occasionally slip into gigawatts or gigawatt hours. And just to make sure everyone understands that's a, a gigawatt is a thousand megawatts, a gigawatt hour is a thousand megawatt hours. Um, and then the other thing that I want to make sure that we all are familiar with is the, the primary metric of our report, and that's this watts per customer ratio. It's the, the installed capacity uh, divided by the number of customers that it serves. And it's the installed capacity is where it's uh, attributed to the load it's serving. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So it's not necessarily where it's installed. And this gets to the, the comment Steve was making about how we're seeing things uh, increasing where the, the projects are done across state lines from where the customer is physically located. So I wanna put that out there. Um, but the metrics, the watts per customer metric in general allows us to do a kind of a fair and unbiased uh, comparison of states to each other or of utilities to each other. And it, it levels the playing field. It, it lets the small guys shine and uh, holds the big guys to account. Um, <clears throat> so I, I mentioned that, uh, you know, the, the numerator of that ratio is where the capacity is attributed, not necessarily where it's installed. It's where it serves load. So that's why I put this text in here <coughs> in that comes directly out of our methods and details page of the report. Um, we use two different complementary methods. So there, there is one page of the report, uh, the forecast for Southeast states, it's on page 11, that reflects the solar capacity in the state where originates. And I'll, I'll point that out when we get to it. But for all the other ones, we correlate the capacity to where the load is served. Um, and again, we'll come back to that at the end because it's becoming increasingly uh, interesting to take a look at that. So this is the slide of the graph from page 11 of the report. It's the only one where the we're allocating the capacity to the state where it's installed, as opposed to um, letting it flow to, to where it's serving load. Um, and, and this, I guess, will allow me to make the, the first key point. Uh, Kate said we'll take questions at the end, and we will, and I've seen some already starting to come through. Uh, but I do think it, it may seed the conversation a little bit if I share with you what I see as the key observations from assembling the data. And one of those is that, that 2020 was the last year that North Carolina will be able to claim the solar leader for the Southeast. We've been observing a, a convergence for several years and it predicted that 2021, this year, would be the year that Florida overtakes North Carolina on installed capacity. It all happened in 2020, which is not quite. Um, and we can confidently assert that it's already happened in the first few months of 2021. Florida is now the, 
the solar leader of the Southeast. But since this is a, a report that looks back on calendar year 2020 and forward on our four year rolling time horizon to 2024, um, you can see that Florida fell just shy of North Carolina in installed capacity in 2020. If I shift that and look at where the load is served, that margin of victory was even smaller. So we attributed a total in, for North Carolina of 3,955 megawatts on a, a full year operational equivalent basis for year 2020. I'll explain that very briefly. It's not how much was installed or on the ground operating on January 1st. It's also not how much was operating on December 31st. It really represents more or less an average of that because different projects come online different times of year. Um, so it's, it's basically the amount that was operational during the peak solar generation period of the summer. And again, um, we have 3,955 allocated to North Carolina for 2020. Florida came in at 3,909. So a very slim margin of victory for North Carolina and Florida has already surpassed North Carolina in the early months of, of 2021. Um, and this, this illustrates further that point about where the uh, capacity is installed versus where it's serving load. Because on the previous slide, uh, we were crediting North Carolina with 4,269 megawatts of solar physically installed in the state of North Carolina, but about 7% of the solar in North Carolina serves load in South Carolina instead. Um, the next observation is that South Carolina has also now eclipsed North Carolina. It didn't quite happen by the end of 2020, but has happened in the first few months of 2021. Um, and it's shown when we look at this watts per customer ratio. Uh, and in fact, that's, that's why this watts per customer ratio is so useful because North Carolina serves, utilities in North Carolina serve about 5.2 million customers. The utilities in South Carolina serve about 2.7 million. So North Carolina has about twice the customer base. Um, and that's in part why this ratio works. So it's a numerator and denominator combination. And we're forecasting now that not only will South Carolina be far and away the leader on watts per customer ratio for the Southeast through 2024, Georgia as well will be surpassing North Carolina's watts per customer ratio. You can see that crossover there toward the right-hand side of the graph. Um, and that was not obvious last year in our report. So that's another bit of kind of new information as we've added in uh, the additional pipeline of solar projects and expanded this time horizon to 2024, we see that crossover. Uh, so Georgia will also be surpassing North Carolina. This is when we look at the full Southeast as a region. So we define seven states of the Southeast, uh, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi. And I will point out that the parts of North Carolina and the parts of Mississippi that participate in the wholesale markets, we exclude from our boundary for the Southeast. But that's what's shown here. Uh, and there was a total, again, on that full year operational equivalent basis of uh, 12,696 megawatts or 12.7 gigawatts, if you wanna speak in that term. Um, and mathematically that generates an average for the region of 423 watts per customer. That's, if you think about it in terms of a kind of a standard size panel, obviously panels now modules vary, but it's about one and a half modules per customer in the Southeast. And to Steve's point earlier as well, we observed that, that the pandemic really impacted distributed solar more significantly than utility scale solar. Um, we, we still saw growth in both sectors. We saw growth in the distributed energy sector, the, the yellow bars on the top of these, uh, the yellow caps on the top of these bars. Um, it was about 300 megawatts of distributed solar in 2020. That was about the same as we saw in 2019, but we were expecting more in 2020. So it did kind of constrain that segment a little bit. Um, utility scale, on the other hand, 
didn't seem very constrained at all. In fact, we had a, a, a record year, um, about 3.7 gigawatts in the southeast of utility scale. It was deemed an essential service and, and most of those projects uh, just forged ahead with, with safety precautions in place for the workers. But uh, it was pretty easy for, for those projects to social distance and get um, project work done throughout the calendar year 2020. People are usually fond of our sunriser slide. Um, and I think this year will be no different. We have uh, two new sunrisers this year. Well, let me back up. <laughs> the sunrisers are the seven utilities that demonstrate the highest ambition. And we mathematically calculate that based on the difference between their watts per customer ratio in the base year of 2020 and their watts per customer forecast for the year 2024. So the, the delta there is what defines this ambition and the seven utilities with the highest ambition qualify for our Sunriser list. Um, Knoxville Utilities Board is on there for the first time this year because they commissioned 502 megawatts of projects through the TVA Green Invest Program. And they have a, a customer base of just over 200,000 customers. So SACE is now forecasting that, that KUB, Knoxville Utilities Board, will be offering its customers 2,552 watts per customer of solar in 2024. Um, similarly, there are two additional 78.5 megawatt projects recently approved for Mississippi that will interconnect into the Southern Company system in Mississippi. And will effectively double the solar ratio for Mississippi Power by 2024. So Mississippi Power is making its debut on this list as well. Um, then we've got several that have been on there before. Walton EMC remains at the top of the list, um, largely because of uh, projects that they're doing for Facebook um, in Georgia, where I'm personally located. Um, and in Tampa Electric, I wanted to single them out as well because they're the only utility that has been on this list for all four of our reports. So kudos to them. All right, on the large utility system leaderboard, I'll make just a, a couple points here. Uh, first is that uh, DEP, Duke Energy Progress, and uh, DESC, Dominion Energy South Carolina, retained their spots at the top of both lists. The 2020 backwards look, and the 2024 forward look. Georgia Power, who is one of our Sunrisers, um, as they build out the, the um, a previously approved solar that's in the pipeline, it was approved back with their 2019 integrated resources plan, all that will be online um, for our 2024 uh, forecast. That shows them moving into the number three slot. So that's a little bit new. Um, and then we have one new sun blocker because we're, we're all about identifying leaders and laggards. The leaders are the sun risers that I've already talked about. The laggards are what we call sun blockers. And that's any utility that with their four year forecast is less than last year's average for the region. So, so on this slide, you can see that last year's average was 423 watts per customer. Both Alabama Power and the North Carolina Electric Cooperatives have a forecast that's lower than that. So they earn the, the distinction as sun blockers. I would point out that uh, TVA has been on that list in the past and mathematically just barely crept above that because they're predicted now to be 425 watts per customer in 2024 um, versus last year's average of 423. So they're, they're just out of the doghouse, if you will. One last slide, and Steve kind of touched on it a little bit with his opening comments, uh, and then we'll open things up for questions here. Um, but in addition to kind of looking at what's new, we like to look at what's next. And, and both of these things Steve touched on, one of those is about the clean electricity standard. Um, we've talked in the past with our reports about how the policies and drivers for solar in the Southeast have been rather inconsistent. Um, 
we've got legislation driving in some states. In other states, it's regulatory decisions that are driving. And in other states, uh, not the legislature nor the regulators um, are really uh, influencing things very much. They're leaving it up to individual utility management decisions. Um, but a federal clean electricity standard would resolve that, that patchwork of inconsistency uh, because then we would be able to have defined expectations and timetables for each utility. Um, and you wouldn't have this wide range between the leaders and laggards um, and, and some states taking full advantage of the jobs and economic development and others not. It, it would really uh, harmonize things across the Southeast. So that would be very useful. Uh, and SACE is a big supporter of the call for a clean electricity standard by 2035. Um, the other thing, and Steve mentioned this as well, is that we're, we're starting to see more and more of these projects that are happening across state lines. And it's not really new. In fact, there was one already in our data set uh, when we started this reporting four years ago, and we included a reference to it in our methods. So I, I clipped the text here on this slide. Um, there was a solar project in Northern Alabama in TVA territory that mathematically more of its capacity was serving load in Tennessee than in Alabama. And so we use that as the example to kind of explain this process that we want to, to really look at where the load is being served. Um, but we're starting to see more and more of that. Knoxville Utilities Board is the prime example, right? They're on our, our solar, um, our sunrisers list for the first time this year because they've done that 502 megawatts of projects through TVA's Green Invest program. The however of that though is more than half of what they've commissioned is not in the state of Tennessee, it's in Mississippi. 270 megawatts out of the 502 is in Mississippi. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that. Um, we've made some comments that a more Western portfolio of solar can be advantageous because you get a bit of the late afternoon sun to serve back to the load centers um, as people are coming home from work and starting to, to turn on their electric appliances. Uh, so it makes sense, but we wanna make sure that it's done right. And there are various organizations that govern this in one respect or another uh, with, with rules and guidelines for how you account these transactions. And we're not necessarily saying that, that anyone is not abiding by them, but we think more research is necessary at this point because with all the hype associated with the projects in their host communities, those host communities may think that they're benefiting from the output of those projects. And, and yes, they, they will benefit from the jobs and the economic development, either tax revenues or payment in lieu of taxes as the case may be. So there will be benefits, but they may think they're getting renewable electricity when instead those green attributes may be stripped away and sold to somebody else in a different state. And, and we just wanna make sure there's transparency and, and proper accounting in that process. So I motored right through that and I think I've left us plenty of time for some questions. I put my uh, contact information up here on the slide. Anybody that wants to jot that down can, but we'll get through as many questions as we can uh, during the remaining time. Great. Kyle or Kate? Who, yeah, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, so my name is Kyle James. I'm the development manager here at SACE. I'm going to assist Brian and Maggie here with the Q&A. Uh, we've received a ton of good questions. So just as a reminder, if you guys want to ask questions to our panelists, please submit them via the Q&A box on the bottom of the screen, um, and we will get to as many as we can. Our first question, Brian, is from John Downey with the Charlotte Business Journal. And John asks, it makes sense that Florida, a larger state with a lot of sun, would eventually take first place in the southeast but Georgia is smaller than North Carolina. Should we attribute North Carolina's pending loss to Georgia to more restrictive solar policies in North Carolina since 2017? Um, well, thanks for the question, John. I think I'm gonna maybe go back a, a slide um, to maybe contribute to this answer. Um, so, so in terms of absolute installed capacity, I think that's where uh, the, the commentary is relevant for Florida versus North Carolina. Florida is a, a bigger state, bigger population, bigger utilities, whatever, and, and um, all 
they were kind of late to the game. Let's admit that, but they've really been coming on strong lately. Once the, once the economics shifted to where solar is among the least cost resources they could be bringing on now. Um, so I think that's what we would attribute the Florida overtaking North Carolina to. And then to your question about Georgia overtaking, um, it Georgia will surpass North Carolina both in watts per customer and in total installed capacity. And I think it's more about favorable decisions in Georgia rather than unfavorable in North Carolina. Because I, I think really what <laughs> North Carolina deserves credit for jumpstarting the Southeast with very favorable decisions. It, it's the only state in the Southeast that has a renewable portfolio standard. So when we're talking about calling on the federal government to set up a clean electricity standard, North Carolina has had one and it's what really propelled their leadership to begin with, uh, along with uh, some pretty favorable interpretations of, of PURPA legislation. Um, and it's only recently that as, as they've, as North Carolina has become a little more saturated, let's say, and other states that weren't doing as much early on have made some more uh, assertive decisions uh, in, in the case of Georgia Power with the Public Service Commission, doubling the amount of solar that they had in their IRP in 2019. And then in the case of the EMC community, um, really getting a shot in the arm from commercial and industrial interests, Facebook in particular, that has been commissioning so much solar within the, the Walton EMC and Oglethorpe Power, Green Power EMC umbrella. Um, I think that's what I would say is the, the uh, driver behind Georgia overtaking North Carolina. Great, and that's a great segue um, into a, a short question we had right after that. Uh, and Maggie, you can probably tackle this one. Uh, Drew Gillett asked, how do you measure watts per customer behind meter? Yes, hi. Uh, good question, Drew. And um, I think the main thing is um, how do we get that number on watts that are behind the meter? Um, and I'll I'll answer that and then see if Brian wants to, to chime in anything. But uh, we take... Um, we look at the distributed solar primarily that's reported uh, by each utility through the EIA Energy Information Administration, um, and we compile uh, all of that data. That's also where uh, we get a lot of our, um, you know, utility scale or large scale solar projects that have already, you know, been named and announced, and we know what they are. Um, the utilities also file those uh, with the EIA. Um, but then we we include uh, you know what they're projecting. Maybe it's in an IRP. Maybe they've made an announcement of one of those um, you know contracts that they're they're uh, they're doing, um, but that they haven't yet put that in uh, the EIA. So we are also sort of tracking that um, additional uh, amount or additional projects that we would see. Uh, but I think you know primarily in the baseline of our for our both our backcast or, you know, looking historically and our forecast are, are based on that EIA data. Anything you want to add on that, Brian? Yeah, just in, in case anybody's super interested in which EIA reports it is that those come from. Um, so the utility scale stuff comes from EIA 860 and the distributed solar comes from EIA 861. And the, the 861 report actually has three different subcategories that we pull from. Uh, we have the net metered solar, we have the non-net metered distributed, as they call it, which is really the, the tariff systems, that, that the buy all, sell all kind of two meter systems they have in the TVA region, for example, under the, the former uh, Green Power Partners program. Um, and then there's also a virtual net metering report that we pull. So, um, I actually participate in a system like that where there's a, um, a centralized array that I subscribe to a portion of and through a virtual net metering arrangement, it's um, the kilowatt hours that are generated down at that array are deducted off of my bill before the rates are applied. Um, so all three of those combined represent this distributed solar segment in our report. Um, and the behind the meter part of the question is really has more to do with the kilowatt hours or megawatt hours. 
uh, than the capacity itself. So the utilities report the capacity through EIA 861, and they also report how much megawatt hours was exported onto their system. The remainder is what was consumed behind the meter by the, the owner or operator. And we use some assumed capacity factors to be able to back calculate what that was for our megawatt hour calculations. Great, um, Brian. So we've received a ton of questions about rooftop solar versus utilities, utility scale solar. How do we compare the two? What are the benefits of one versus the other? Um, I know recent re reports have shown that rooftop solar can be lower in cost when taking transmission and other costs into account. Can you talk a bit about the comparison between rooftop solar and utility scale solar and maybe the potential to break them out in future solar reports? Um, sure, and, and I would say that we already do break them out and, and maybe the explanation that I just gave about uh, 860 and 861 utility scale versus distributed may have clarified that. Um, in terms of the, the, the benefits, um, they are, they're unique and different types of animals. They, they really serve a different purpose. And, and I will say something that we've said before on this, um, SACE supports solar across all market segments. So we don't wanna see one succeed at the expense of another. We, we're all about utility scale solar, but we also want a commercial and industrial segment to, to have you know viable market and re residential rooftop as well. Um, so we're, um, and, and we often throw community or shared solar into that mix as well. So across that entire spectrum, SACE wants to see more solar, more clean energy. And it even showed up in our uh, clean electricity standard report last week, as we were putting together portfolios of, of resources that utilities in the Southeast could use to fulfill a 100% clean electricity standard. And in, in all cases, there was a substantial amount of uh, distributed solar in addition to a substantial amount of utility scale. It's not an either or proposition, it's really a, a both and. Um, and, and I think the, the question, if I reflect back on it, um, talked a little bit about the costs and benefits when you factor in um, you know, the, the distribution system and the transmission system. And, um, and also when you factor in, I don't think it was part of the question, but when you factor in the resiliency that having solar on your own rooftop, particularly if you have a battery backup system of your own, um, can provide. There's, there's lots of different motivations um, for why one would want to do solar on their own premises. And, uh, and yeah, they, we, we need to prevent this um, kind of false dichotomy that the utilities will often use where they say, well, I can do utility scale solar for a dollar a watt. Why would I want to incentivize residential solar when it's more than $2 a watt? Because that, that's not an apples to apples comparison. Residential Solar on on one's own rooftop serves a, a different purpose and there's a different value proposition. Great, yeah, that was a combination of a bunch of questions, so I think you tackled that perfectly. Um, our next question is from Brennan Rivers, who's with the WJCT in Jacksonville, Florida, and Brennan wants to know. Uh, he said that you mentioned that in the region, the pandemic seemed to negatively impact rooftop solar adoption, but not utility scale solar. Does that hold true at the state level across the southeast? And Brennan is specifically curious about Florida, Brian. Um, so I think, yes, categorically it applied across the region. I do think Florida was able to weather the storm a little bit better than, than other states. Um, and so of, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but of the 300 megawatts of distributed solar across the region, um, a significant portion, and it, it might've even been a majority of that was, was Florida. Um, there, were, there was a lot of additional momentum in the system in Florida um, because, you know, leasing of solar in Florida hadn't been around for very long. It just got approved back in 2018, I guess it was. So those contracts were kind of ramping up in 2019 and they were able to sustain through 2020. Um, plus you had concerns about the investment tax credit ratcheting down, which, you know, it, when we were, um, putting together our original forecast, we had no idea the pandemic was going to happen and we had no idea that the ITC was going to get extended. 
Um, but so a lot of people in the early part of the year were, were wanting to get it done before the ITC expired, when of course it ends up not expiring. Um, and we had a big uh, uh, workshop with the Public Service Commission in Florida last year where there was some nervousness over whether uh, the net metering program in Florida might change. So you had a lot of people in Florida wanting to get their project in before something might change. As it turns out, after that workshop, the, the commission decided not to make any changes anytime soon. Um, so that was very good. Um, but I, I do think Florida, like I said, weathered the storm a little bit better than, than other states. In general, we have seen year after year about uh, seven out of every eight megawatts being utility scale and one out of every eight being uh, distributed. So 12 and a half percent. Last year, it was about one out of every 13. So you had you had 300 megawatts of distributed solar and uh, about 3,700 megawatts of utility scale. So the, the proportion changed, but utility scale forged ahead and distributed solar moved forward incrementally, but, but not at the same pace that utility scale did. Great. Um, the next question I have, I think would be a great question for Steve and or Maggie. Um, our next question is from John. Wing and he asked that many countries charge CO2 emission fees or give clean energy credits. Will these clean energy incentives come to the US soon? Um, well, we would welcome, I mean, look, the, the climate crisis is serious enough that we need to be using all the tools that we have in our tool, our policy toolbox to do that. And so we we are interested in seeing that there's a robust discussion about using mechanisms like the question that was asked. Unfortunately, um, the current situation in Washington is that there has been, at the federal level at least, there's been very little traction um, on you know, really putting a solid price on carbon and really addressing this issue head on like it needs to be addressed. Um, the clean electricity standard, which we're advocating for, um, gets you there and it has some, some important policy mechanisms to do it. And so it is in uh, full discussion right now, I think as part of the, the uh, infrastructure bill that's being contemplated at the federal level. Um, there are states and even regions that have you know, policies that look at putting a price on carbon, like the, the Northeast and some Western states have looked at this and there continues to be dialogue in states that are progressive and leaning forward in really trying to address this. But um, it really needs to be dealt with at the federal level. And unfortunately, we still have resistance at the federal level. And unfortunately, a lot of that resistance is coming from elected officials from the Southeast, even though the Southeast is, continues to get hammered in very real ways by extreme weather, um, that are you know facilitated by climatic changes that are part of the climate crisis that we're dealing with the climate disruption. So um, I think it's an excellent question. Um, we wish there was more uh, of that really thoughtful um, policy uh, work going on with electeds, but unfortunately, there is uh, one of the political parties is still um, not as engaged as they need to be on this very serious uh, issue that faces all of humanity. Absolutely. Maybe, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but um, that's my perspective on it, at least right now. Maggie, do you want to add anything there? Uh, nope, I think you covered it. Perfect. All right. Um, our next question is from Dennis Pillion. He's with Alabama.com and the Birmingham News. Um, and Brian, Dennis wants to know that why Alabama and Alabama Power rated toward the bottom of this report and especially lags in distributed solar. What factors do you see contributing to this? And if challenges to Alabama Power solar fee are successful, how might that change the outlook for solar in Alabama? Okay. Well, the second part of that question almost answers the first part. Um, that Alabama Power charges a, a punitive fee and even increased it last year. Um, so, so people who have solar on their rooftop uh, can, can barely get a payback. 
Uh, they're they're paying almost as much in fees per month as they're they're paying for the system itself. Um, so that's what's holding back their distributed solar segment. Um, the part of the reason that they fell on our uh, ranking this year and got into that uh, that category of sunblockers is um, more than five years ago they got approval. Alabama Power got approval by the Alabama Public Service Commission to do 500 megawatts of solar. And it was pretty encouraging at the time. Uh, they did about 100 megawatts of it. And the other 400 has been sitting there pending for more than five years now. And it does have an expiration on it. It expires six years after that initial order. So the fall of this year is, is their deadline for getting it done. And it's becoming evident that, that they're not going to get it done. Um, Last year, actually uh, late year before last, they also put in some solar into another docket packaged with, with a bunch of things. They, they wanted a certificate of public convenience and necessity for uh, building a gas plant and buying another gas plant, some other things. But then they put in 400 megawatts of solar in there as well. And we even blogged about it at the time that... Um, they were double dipping because this is solar that's already been approved. So they they were just, I uh, don't remember whether he called it lipstick on a pig or something. They were just putting it in to make sure that their gas proposal didn't smell so bad. Um, and we called them out on that and the company came back and said, no, no, this is an entirely different 400 megawatts. Um, and it turns out it, it's not. Um, so so we've adjusted our forecast accordingly and. Um, that's why they're they're projected to come in four years from now at, at less than the current average for the region. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, our next question is from Mary Lander. She's with the Savannah Morning News, and Mary wants to know: Has SACE done any comparisons of where rooftop solar customers get the best payback? She said she would love to see that. Um, well, we haven't done a report on it, um, but I. I, I guess it's safe to say that um, the the payback is better where the policies are better. Uh, so so where there is a true retail net metering, um, that's where the payback tends to be better. So Florida has retail net metering. Um, North Carolina and South Carolina uh, have, or at least recently had full retail net metering. Um, I'll talk about South Carolina briefly because uh, South Carolina is the, the geography that has the highest penetration of uh, rooftop solar in the Southeast. It, the utilities there were getting close to 2% and, and there was a threshold established by law about net metering until the utilities hit 2%. So when they, they hit it um, and part of the Energy Freedom Act from last year was, um, was to to reconcile that to to eliminate the cap and find alternative methods and we just went through regulatory proceedings recently to establish what the successor tariff would be um, when the the full retail net metering is no longer offered so it's just happened within the last month um, and both Dominion Energy South Carolina and now both Duke Energy Progress and Duke Energy Carolinas um, have a solar choice metering tariff, which um, which are are fair. They they really represent the kind of the next evolution of ne of solar net metering. Um, so, so I would say the one the places that have net metering and head into that the places that have high electricity bills, electricity rates. Um, it, that that will mathematically make your uh, rooftop solar investment pay off faster. And let me let me jump in real quick because I, I just want to give a, a historic example of where this is just painfully obvious. The the Tennessee Valley Authority coming at around 2009 actually effectively had a policy to where they were giving their customers. Um, who had rooftop solar, what well, was effectively a feed-in tariff. They were giving uh, an index rate above the retail rate that 
And, and they talked about it very specifically. They said, look, we can use these policies to incentivize the solar market and really you know, accelerate the, the deployment of solar. And um, you know, I know firsthand because I participated in it um, and they were given 11 cents above the retail rate and it was indexed. And if the retail rate went, it would basically fluctuate 11, 12 cents. Um, they gradually, as the price of solar came down, they began to remove some of that. And then we, we thought we had an agreement with them, even though they don't do technical net metering where they're gonna keep it at retail exchange basically. And then now TVA has um, basically dropped it down to where they're giving what they call avoided cost, which they don't even, you know, we don't even think is an accurate representation of their avoided cost, which is roughly two cents. And they, they've effectively killed the market, uh, the rooftop market uh, to a large degree in, in, in the state of Tennessee. And they're not doing anything through policy mechanisms to actually support or encourage, and they're actually talking down uh, rooftop solar. So this, over the arc of roughly 10 to 11 years, you saw a utility using some of the best policy mechanisms and then going all the way to using some of the worst policy mechanisms. And you can see exactly how that impacted the market and affected customers. Um, it's, a, it's a classic example of how not to do policy uh, in, a, in a particular state or, or with a utility. And, and again, TVA is a laggard because of that. And, and they continue to sort of fall further and further behind, I think in many ways with the, uh, the other utilities in the region. Great, well, now that we're, we're on the topic of utilities, I think this is a great question for Maggie. Um, Maggie, this question is from Ted Volskay. He wants to know what percentage of utilities are on target for achieving 100% clean energy by 2035? Um, all right, so of the utilities that we track, which is the ones in the Southeast, the, the map is actually on the slide that we're, we're looking at right now. Um, zero are on track to be carbon free by 2035. Um, actually, of, of all the major utilities, none of them are on track to be carbon free even by 2050. Uh, and I will um, direct you to our decarbonization report, which we uh, came out with in April um, of this year that looks at exactly that. Uh, not only, you know, how on or off track are we, uh, but we did a calculation where you know we take the utilities at their current rate of decarbonization and and track that out and see okay when would they actually reach that that zero carbon um, you know when would they cross the x axis uh, basically and so um, we we have that in the report uh, it's it, it's not. Um, it's not the most encouraging because, you know, like I said, they're not on track to meet by 2050 and we're trying to push them uh, to be decarbonized by 2035. Uh, but it, again, this is based on where the utilities plan stand right now today. Um, and so we are, you know, working hard to change both policy and, you know, intervening directly um, with uh, utilities and regulators on those plans to, uh, you know, bend that curve and, and hit that uh, zero carbon by 2035 target. Right, right. And, and like the report said, it is possible. It'll just take some change today. Um, so Brian, back to the uh, solar, Robin Kemp with the Clayton Crescent in Jonesboro, Georgia wants to know if states mandate grid tie solar as in Georgia, is the claim of lowering electric bills valid? In other words, if Georgia Power controls all the solar through grid tie legislation, would they not also effectively create a monopoly? Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I'm not completely sure what uh, what she's getting at. Um, grid tie solar. So, so I think. All of the, the interconnection agreements for distributed solar, like if, if I put it on my house um, and then I am still connected to the grid and um, this is where the, the net metering type of compensation model comes into play. Uh, when I'm using my own electricity, nothing is coming or going through my connection to the grid. But there are times of the day when I'm consuming more than I'm generating and I'm pulling from the grid 
and I pay the retail rate. And there are potentially times of the day when I am generating more than I'm consuming and I am exporting to the grid. And net metering would allow retail compensation for that versus wholesale or avoided cost compensation, which is kind of what Steve was talking about with, with what TVA offers now in their dual meter setup. Um, so I'm not sure that that contributes to the monopoly really that I mean, Georgia Power by definition has a monopoly territory assigned to them in, in the state um, and, and they're regulated by the Public Service Commission uh, and the Territorial Act of the state government in order to, to set that up. Um, and they are offering a form of net metering now for the first time. It was approved in the rate case in 2019, but they only got the mechanics of it set up before by the middle of last year. It started either June or July. Um, and it's, it's monthly netting, which is prior to that, they had something they called instantaneous netting, which is kind of a, a nebulous term. It didn't seem to have much meaning to me. Um, but they do net on a monthly basis now. And then if you have excess at the end of that, they compensate it with a cash payment um, versus carrying it month to month throughout the course of an entire year, uh, which is even more favorable for solar. Well, Brian, yeah. Robin chatted us during your response and to restate it, wanted to know which consumers in the Southeast can choose to go off grid to avoid utility pricing. Oh, got it. Um, well, any consumer can choose to do it. <laughs> that That's a, a right that you would have as a homeowner. You're not obliged to, uh, to be connected, but um, most people find it advantageous to be connected to the grid. And, and, and you know, SACE isn't out there trying to, to get everybody to go off the grid. And we're not out there trying to, to um, take revenues away from, from the utilities. I think there's a, a, a constructive uh, uh, arrangement where utilities can respect the value that's provided by self generators and and incentivize or compensate them in a way that is beneficial both to the residential owner of the solar and to the utility system itself. Uh, but it, if people want to, you know, let's say they're they have a mountain cabin and they want to go completely off grid, um, you would have to have solar with battery backup systems size to be able to to store enough when the sun is shining to be able to power all of the applications the appliances that you'd want to run when the sun's not shining. Um, but it, it's theoretically possible, just uh, may not be economically attractive to do it. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, all right, we have time for just a couple more here to stay within the hour. Um, so Brian, this question is from, from Frank Holloman. He wants to know, what do you consider the principal barriers to solar expansion in North Carolina? Um, North Carolina is interesting um, in that I mentioned earlier that they kind of jump started the Southeast for us with, with favorable legislation um, and, and PERPA interpretation there um, and a tax incentive as well for a lot of uh, these five megawatt projects throughout the state. And that's why um, up until very recently, North Carolina had the second most solar of any state in the country behind California. Uh, Texas is, um, has overtaken them apparently, and according to our numbers, Florida has now as well. Uh, but but North Carolina did get a jump start, and and then with a with a second round of legislation there, they created a a competitive procurement process uh, with some uh, prescribed amounts of solar capacities that. Um, both of the Duke utilities would would have to bring online that they would source through a competitive procurement process. They've been through a couple of tranches now and, and we're um, in the process of figuring out whether they need to do a third tranche to, to meet the requirements there or not. Um, so, so I think one thing is the, the, the penetration of solar uh, has historically been higher than other southeastern states. So they were slowing their pace down anyway. Um, and I think at this point, they there's not as much pressure, uh, either legislative or regulatory 
uh, at the moment to, to insist on it. And then when we talk to developers in the state, um, there are complications and delays with the interconnection process. Uh, so, so I think that is also contributing to, to you know, what is slowing down the expansion in, in North Carolina. One of the things, every year we look at the, the updates to the IRPs by Duke Energy Progress and Duke Energy Carolinas, they seem to be increasing the amount of solar on the out years, like 10 and 15 years down the line, but reducing the near-term amount of solar on the kind of one to five year outlook. Um, and since we only look at four years, our, our forecast for the Duke utilities in North Carolina seem to be ratcheting down slightly each year. Um, and in, because we're not looking out longer, you're not even seeing that their long-term plan actually shows an increasing amount of solar. Great, okay. Um, I have just a couple more here, Brian. Um, this question is from Rhonda Roth with Sierra Club, and she wants to know, do any of the states have significant just distributed solar compared with the utility scale? Um, not really in the Southeast. I apologize, because I uh, probably could have used other slides to, to sh showcase some of my answers. Um, but now I'm switching back to this one because it makes sense for this question. Um, so in each of these cases, the bars, the blue bars represents the utility scale and the yellow caps represents the distributed solar part. Um, and you can see that there's almost no yellow for those Alabama, uh, <laughs> the, the Alabama state. And uh, that got to an earlier question as well. Uh, Mississippi doesn't have much either. So Florida, when you look at this is the one that has the most distributed solar as a proportion to its utility scale. Uh, North Carolina has a good amount. South Carolina has a good amount. Um, but but none really, if, if the question is, do any have a, a, a significant proportion? I'd say not in the Southeast. Um, you'd have to look at a state like Hawaii before you'd start to see where distributed solar is half or more of the total generation capacity. Great. Well, that'll wrap up the Q&A segment here. Um, I just want to thank everyone for the terrific questions and for sticking with us and, uh, you know, coming to see our fourth annual solar report. So, Brian, Steve, I'll let you guys wrap it up here. Well, I just want to say thank you to everybody for participating today. And um, I'm not sure if we got through all the questions. I'll look back now um, afterwards. And if there's any others that I can respond to afterwards, I will. And uh, I will switch the slide back actually to my um, contact information in case anybody didn't get a chance to jot that down. You can feel free to, to write to me afterwards. Thanks again. Yep. And just, just thanks everybody. And uh, feel free to ask us any questions and uh, please stay engaged and, you know, both be in touch with your elected officials on policy questions and be in touch with utilities on, you know, what you desire as a customer. I think, uh, it's, uh, it's important to continue to communicate and you know, speak up if you're in favor of this technology and be informed. So thanks for taking the time to spend some time with us. Bye.